I'd like to turn now to our next topic, uh, divorce and remarriage. And as, uh, just as an aside, as one member of the class uh, mentioned, uh, we've been talking about, you know, finding ways to talk about these issues uh, in our churches. And uh, uh, as our, one of our colleagues here in class, student colleagues said, uh, remember January 22nd, Sanctity of Life Sunday. Uh, I don't know to what extent this is done in Southern California, but many, many churches, evangelical churches in metropolitan Chicago uh, on that Sunday uh, do talk about abortion biblically. And they, they have a sermon on it. So, um, you know, I think this, these are, are occasions where we can take an opportunity to do this. It won't seem like uh, it's overly intrusive uh, or that you're, you know, turning the world upside down just to say something about this. This is a natural time to discuss this. Um, in talking about divorce and remarriage, there are many ways that we could go at this. Um, and obviously, I pursued it one way in the book, and I'm hoping that you're reading that. Uh, but the way I present this when I teach this at Trinity and uh, elsewhere is the way I would uh, pretty much present this if I were preaching on it in a local church. And um, so, as we go through this, I hope uh, not only that this helps you to understand the issue, but it gives you some ideas of how you might go about preaching on this yourself. Uh, a good bit of the controversy surrounds the meaning of the exception clause, uh, and it's only in Matthew's accounts of Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage that you have the exception clause. So it has always seemed to me that um, in an initial message, uh, the place to begin would be with Jesus teaching on divorce. And I find that it is especially uh, helpful to do this from Matthew 19 verses 1 through 12. This is the uh, in Matthew's gospel, the most extended um, teaching of Jesus on this topic. So I hope you have your Bibles with you because you are going to need them uh, for this discussion. And uh, we want to go through this passage step by step uh, to see what it teaches. And as I shared with you on Monday... My concern is not just that you understand uh, the teaching in general, but that you understand the logic behind the teaching so that uh, you will be able, when you hear someone's story, to know how to assess whether their divorce, if they've been divorced, was biblically uh, allowable or not. And uh, that will, of course, help you to know whether they, biblically speaking, have a right to remarry. And, of course, all of that should help you in deciding uh, whether or not you could perform the marriage, should they ask you to do that. Now, this is an issue in my own experience. Um, I pastored for a couple of years before I began to teach. And this was one of two or three issues that came up repeatedly over and over again. And I am confident that this is something that you do confront, you have to talk about it, and that you will uh, have brought to your attention and questions will be asked about it. Uh, so we really need to be as clear in our understanding of what Scripture teaches on this as we can. And um, 
you know, it's one thing when you finish seminary and you get your first pastorate and um, someone comes into your office and uh, wants you to uh, talk about this. They're thinking of getting a divorce, but they're not sure and they want to know from you what the Bible says. And, uh, you know, for maybe the first few months that you're there, <clears throat> if you are to say, well, you know, I'm just recently out of seminary and I'm just sort of getting my feet wet. There's, there's some um, issues that we did discuss them in seminary, but they're especially difficult and I haven't yet fully studied this and I haven't made up my mind, uh, but I know I need to do that, but I'm not prepared to do that. That will be okay for a few months. <laughs> but if that continues to be your answer, six, eight months down the road, uh, your people are going to wonder, well, given the importance of this, why haven't you made time to study it and figure out what you hold? Um, and uh, from a practical standpoint, it would be a pretty good thing before you agree to be pastor of a church to find out what their policies are on remarrying people um, because you may wind up in a situation like I did. Uh, I pastored in uh, metropolitan Chicago in a suburb that was almost entirely Roman Catholic. And our church was the only Protestant church in the whole community. And uh, you know what the Roman Catholic Church's stance on divorce and remarriage is. No, never, under any circumstances. And yet that doesn't mean that Catholics don't divorce and they want to remarry. And uh, they knew that they would get nowhere if they went to their parish priest. So there were... Uh, number of times within the two years where a couple who were Roman Catholic uh, one or the other or both had been divorced they had met fallen in love and want to be married they would like it to be done uh, in a religious setting and religious service but they can't get it in the Roman Catholic Church so they come knocking on the door of the local Protestant Church and they want to know if I would marry them um, now don't, don't think that there won't be any of your own people who ask you that too. But if you're in a situation like the one where I pastored, um, you know, you're likely to get other people who are Roman Catholics to come asking you if you'll perform the wedding. So at some point you need to think this through and make up your mind what position you hold on it and why uh, so that you're ready for this. And you may discover that once you do this, you don't actually agree with your church's policy on this issue. And it would be kind of nice to know that before you agreed to be their pastor uh, so that you could talk with them about this and this doesn't turn out <clears throat> to be a divisive issue between you and your congregation. Uh, if you figure out your position after you've come and you find that it doesn't square with what your church uh, thinks. You, you may be thinking, well, that isn't going to be a problem for me because I'm going to go out and plan a church. Yeah, but fine, you got to write a church constitution and doctrinal statement at some point. Um, and surely you've got to say something about this issue and you can't if you haven't made up your mind. Well, you may think it's impossible to do so, uh, biblically speaking, because scripture just doesn't say an awful lot. And it actually doesn't say an awful lot. And what it says is not entirely the easiest to figure out so that's why I'm discussing this in some detail and I hope you can see that there's actually a whole lot more 
that, that it's possible to figure out than first meets the eye. So, let's begin with Matthew chapter 19, verses 3, uh, well, verses 1 through 12. And um, uh, Jesus teaches several things in this passage about divorce and remarriage. And the first thing that I want to note that he teaches is that God originally didn't intend for there to be any divorce. Now, uh, how do I get this out of this passage? Well, let's begin. Uh, Matthew 19, verse 1, When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So this begins with a question being posed to Jesus. And the way that it is stated in Matthew's gospel uh, is a tip off as to what they're trying to do. They don't just say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Uh, they don't even say, is there a ground for divorce, a reason that would allow someone to divorce? Uh, they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? That last phrase is key to understanding what they are actually doing. Well, uh, what are they doing? Well, they raise this question, and that last phrase, any and every reason, is a reference to Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, in which passage um, appears the Hebrew phrase, ervat devar, which is translated in a variety of ways depending on uh, your translation. It may say something indecent or uh, something unseemly or whatever. Now, um, if you'll hold your finger in Matthew 19, let's go back to Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1 so I can show you what's going on here. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, the passage is really verses 1 through 4. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from, her, from his house, and if, she, if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then, wow, that was a long if clause, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled, period. That's the first time you see a period in this passage. So verses 1 through uh, 4a are all one sentence. Uh, then the rest of verse 4, that would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land. The Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now, you noticed in verse 1, it says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. <coughs> something indecent is the English translation of ervat devar. And in the Judaism of Jesus' day, there had arisen a debate over the grounds or basis for divorce, <coughs> and it centered around Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, and the meaning of ervat devar. Uh, and basically what people were doing in Jesus' day 
is they were reading Deuteronomy 24, 1 and seeing this reference to something indecent and they're saying, well, what could that something indecent be? And so there arose a debate in Jesus' day within Judaism as to what that indecent thing might be. And there was the assumption that whatever it was, Deuteronomy 24 was saying that if there is this something indecent that shows up in your wife, you have a right to divorce. So what the Pharisees are doing is they are asking Jesus a question that requires him to give his commentary on Deuteronomy 24 <clears throat> and especially on the meaning of Ervat Devar in that passage. That was a very controversial issue. Why? Because within Judaism, there were two different understandings of Ervat Devar and hence two different understandings of what would be appropriate grounds, allowable grounds for divorce. Now, I should pause long enough to say, uh, I'm sure you understand, but let me say this just to be very clear. What we are talking about is not what society's laws will allow you to do. We're talking about what God in his word says we can and we cannot do. And don't assume that the two of those things are necessarily going to be the same. In other words, <clears throat> uh, it is highly likely, in fact, it is the case that what God would allow is considerably less than what society allows. We're concerned about what God's word says about this. Okay, so there's a debate over the meaning of something indecent. What, what were the main views? Well, as I uh, think I just said, there were two main positions. There was a view that was held by a group known as the Hillel. And uh, the Hillel view understood something indecent or unseemly thing to refer to pretty much anything that the uh, husband uh, found disagreeable about his wife. You know, one morning she came down in curlers. Uh, she looked at him. Uh, an odd way she burned his toast or a meal, that should be a legitimate grounds for divorce. On the other hand, there was uh, another group within Judaism known as the Shammai, and they were uh, much, much more conservative. They, they took a much stricter view of what Ervat Devar uh, meant and could mean. And they said, uh, no, it can't just be anything whatsoever. It has to be something that is a sexual impropriety, in particular, adultery. Um, and that's what, in fact, the Shammai thought Ervat Devar meant. And since everybody in Jesus' day seemed to think that Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 was laying out a legitimate ground for divorce, uh, you can see why it's important for them to figure out what that ground is. Shammai said only adultery. The Hillel said, well, pretty much anything that you want. Now, coming back to Matthew 19... <clears throat> um, it's the Pharisees who ask the question but don't miss Matthew's commentary on what they're doing uh, what do I mean well as Matthew introduces this <clears throat> he says in verse 3 some Pharisees came to him to test him and then you have the question. So, 
The question they ask is a test for Jesus. How so? And what's the nature of the test? Well, the fact that they say any and every reason means that they're bringing up Ervat Devar and we, we want to know, Jesus, do you side with the Hillel who basically said you could divorce your wife for any and every reason? Or do you side with the Shammai who would say, no, only for adultery? Now, why is this a test? Well, for a very simple reason. The Shammai position was much more conservative and uh, because of that, much stricter, it wasn't particularly popular among the Jews of Jesus' day. On the other hand, the Hillel position was far more libertarian, but it looked like it was a view that was playing fast and loose with the Mosaic Law, trying to find all sorts of loopholes in it. And yet, as you can imagine, it was the Hillel position that was the more popular one. So the Pharisees asked this question as a test. Um, you mean they didn't know what Jesus knew? Or, or thought, no, that's not the sense in which it was a test. It, it was a test in the sense that it was a trap. Because no matter what Jesus says, they think he's going to offend someone. If he sides with the Shammai, well, then he could uh, uh, maintain his position as one who wants to defend the law and uphold it. But, that wasn't the popular position with most of the people, so he's going to make a lot of enemies that way. If he sides with the Hillel, on the other hand, that's going to make him more popular with the people, but then the Pharisees can say, well, you know, how can you claim to be the upholder and defender of the law and you play so fast and loose with it? So they have asked this question, which they think only has two possible answers and whatever Jesus says <clears throat> they believe he's going to get himself in trouble and of course that's exactly what the Pharisees wanted to do. So um, the last phrase of verse 3 the question saying for any and every reason tips us off that that's what they're doing they want to hear his comment on Deuteronomy 21 and uh, excuse me 24 verse 1 and the meaning of Ervat Devar and what he thinks what side he favors in the contemporary debate over that well you and I know that uh, Jesus is too brilliant to be trapped by these mental midgets. <laughs> so um, they want him to choose option A or B and Jesus chooses C, none of the above. Uh, look at the way Jesus responds in verses 4 through 6. Haven't you read, I, I hope you realize how ironic that is, uh, They've just raised an issue of the law and the Pharisees were supposed to be the people who knew it inside and out. And, um, you know, they, they not only knew what it said, but they knew what, uh, how to interpret it and they made a point of uh, being sure they kept every iota of it and informing everybody else that they did. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so when Jesus says, haven't you read that? That's ironic, maybe even sarcastic. You, you who know the law, well, oh really, you know the law. Well, but haven't you read? Uh, by the way, it's in the law. Um, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and 
the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one, uh, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. What, in effect, is Jesus doing? Jesus is, in effect, saying, you want me to comment on this intramural debate within Judaism that's going to get me in hot water with someone no matter what side I take. And yet the key thing is that what you're thinking about is how do we get out of marriage? And you've missed the main point. The main point is not how can we biblic in a biblically acceptable way get out of marriage. The main point is what did God intend when he, when he instituted marriage in the first place? He intended originally that there wouldn't be any divorce whatsoever. So what Jesus does is he's given a dilemma and he rejects both horns of the dilemma and points them back to God's original plan for marriage. But there's something else that is going on here that I wouldn't want uh, you to miss because it's going to be picked up on in another verse. Uh, as we said, uh, Matthew 19.3 uh, makes a reference to Deuteronomy 24 verse 1, which you know, shows that the Pharisees are aware of the Pentateuch. They know something about it. Uh, and so, again, you really see the sarcasm and the ir irony of what Christ is saying. Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said for this reason? What's Jesus quoting? The Pentateuch. Genesis 1 and 2. You great leaders, Jewish leaders of the people who... Think that you are the champions, the great intellects uh, and spiritual upholders of Moses. Uh, are you aware that Moses also said that God's original intention was not for you to be trying to figure out ways to get out of marriage but, uh, and grounds for doing so? But his original intention... Uh, is that marriage would be permanent. It, now, if you're not sure about that, you can look it up. You should know about the Pentateuch, don't you? You've just quoted and referred to it. Well, I can quote the Pentateuch too. And, you know, what Pharisee, no matter how little or how much of the Old Testament and especially the law of Moses, he would have memorized. What Pharisee wouldn't have memorized much of Genesis 1 and 2 by heart? So, um, Jesus then quotes Scripture, quotes the Pentateuch in verses 4 and 5. Uh, verse 4, he quotes from alludes to Genesis 1 27 verse 5 he quotes Genesis 2 24 incidentally I should pause long enough to make one other point uh, according to Jesus uh, in verse 5 who is it who said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become flesh According to Jesus, who said that? God. The creator said. Oh, that's interesting because when you go back to Genesis 2.24, the person who said it is either Adam upon the creation of Eve and him waking up, uh, or it's Moses' commentary on what's just happened but Jesus says it's the creator. The creator is neither Adam nor Moses. It's God. So, uh-oh, do we have a mistake in scripture? No, no. Uh, 
Well, then what's going on? This is one of those passages you point to that demonstrates that in the thinking of Jesus and in biblical teaching, if something appears in Scripture, it's what God has said, even if actually it's what some human being or the author, the human author said. The fact that it's part of Scripture means that it's God who said it. So Jesus is not making a mistake. He is just pointing out that, well, God's the one um, who is behind the writing, one of the two authors of the Pentateuch, the other being Moses. Um, so if you have a Psalm of David, evidently it's David who wrote it, but it's also God who said it. Um, that's important to our understanding of the doctrine of inspiration and inerrancy. Inspiration, because inspiration means something is God's word. Inerrancy, because this appears to be a mistake, and it's not. It's not. Okay, now verse 6, however, does not quote any passage from the Old Testament it is Jesus' summary, if you will, his conclusion uh, of what we should conclude from the scriptures that he's just quoted. And not only what we should conclude, but what the Pharisees should conclude. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. You are so intent to get straight the rules on divorce and remarriage and you're missing the main thing. What God is interested in is one man, one wife, permanence. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So stop thinking about legitimate grounds for getting out of marriage and start thinking about what God intended in the first place when he instituted marriage. Not bad advice to anyone. Um, well, you can imagine that the, the Pharisees at that point uh, maybe were a bit crestfallen uh, because... The trap they laid, I can just imagine, they were so satisfied with themselves. They must have thought, there's no way he's going to get out of this one. Whatever he says, he's going to make someone unhappy, and that'll be good for us and our side. And now Jesus avoids the total point that they're trying to get him to bite on. And it's not just that he rejects the dilemma but by quoting these verses and coming to the conclusion that you have in verse 6, Jesus in essence is saying, hey guys, you're asking the wrong question and focusing on the wrong issue. You shouldn't be thinking about, uh, now let's have a debate and discussion over the acceptable grounds for divorce. You should be thinking God intended marriage to be permanent, so what are the ways that we can encourage other people who are Jews to keep marriage together? Because if anyone should care about doing what God wants you to do, it should be a Pharisee, shouldn't it? Well, what does God want you to do? Well, Jesus points to Genesis 1 and 2. Well, so uh, maybe the discussion is over. Not on your life. These guys were not about to give up. In fact, with the way they respond, you can tell that hearing Jesus' answer, they smell blood in the water. Second point, 
that Jesus teaches is that God permitted divorce for a specific reason. Where does the discussion go after Jesus finishes his comments in verse 6? Well, the Pharisees have a reply, and they must have felt pretty smug. You know, he wriggled off the hook for a moment or two, but we're going to get him back on pretty quick. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now, there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, there's the basic thing that is there on the surface, and there's one or two things that are hidden, or at least I think sort of visible from the surface, but they don't always occur to us. What's their basic reply? Their basic reply is, if God's intention is permanence in marriage, then why did he command people to give a certificate of divorcement and send your wife away, which... This English translation means divorcer. Um, now, in, in one sense, what's happening is Jesus has basically said, you guys are focusing on the wrong thing. And the Pharisees are saying, uh, no, it's the right thing because it's what God has commanded. But there's something further that's going on here. It's, do you, do you notice how they pose the question? They don't say, why then are we told uh, to give a bill of divorcement and send someone away? They don't do that. They say, why then, they ask, did Moses command? In essence, class, that's sort of an underhanded way of saying, you think you can quote Moses to prove your point? Well, we know Moses too. You know the Pentateuch, so do we. And more than that, you've quoted us Moses, but if what you're saying and how you're interpreting Moses is correct, then, Jesus, you've just made Moses contradict Moses because Moses also commanded this other thing. And when you think about it, this other thing and what you've just said, Jesus, can't both be true. <coughs> There's a contradiction there. So, Jesus, you know Moses, so do we. We can quote him too. But more to the point, Jesus... You're quoting an interpretation of Moses, which if anyone wonders exactly what Jesus thinks this means, read verse 6, his commentary on it. Jesus, your interpretation of Moses contradicts other things that Moses says. Uh, which means... What class? You know what it means. Jesus, you have introduced into God's word an error. And yeah, they believed as strongly in inerrancy, even if they didn't have a term for it, as you and I do. So this is a serious complaint. But there's even more here, and be sure that you do not miss it. Because Jesus is going to pick up on it. Now, according to um, verse 7 and the Pharisees, uh, keep that in mind and also keep in mind, or bring to mind, if you will, our discussion the first day about this, the distinction between descriptive and prescriptive language. 
Now, uh, bring those two things together and let me ask you a question. Are the Pharisees saying, uh, if you're right, Jesus, why does Moses describe certain things or why does he prescribe certain things? It's the latter, right? And that's a more serious thing than if he describes a situation because we all now know if we didn't before this week that there is a difference between descriptive and prescriptive language. Something can be described describe and it doesn't force you or command you to do anything but if it is prescribed you have to obey right so it's not just that Jesus appears to be making Moses contradict Moses and definitely Jesus appears to be contradicting Moses it looks like what Jesus is saying is canceling a command of Moses and of God through Moses. That's serious business. Especially if you are a Pharisee. But even if you're just the religious type of Jew, that's serious business. Well, um, as I say, the obvious thing is that the um, Pharisees didn't give up. And um, go away. Hearing Jesus' answer in verses 4 through 6, they smell blood in the water. Now you know what that blood is. You're contradicting Moses. You're making Moses contradict Moses. You're canceling a direct command from Moses. Um, probably people who were listening, if they were Jews and very religious, would, would understand that this question is actually a veiled accusation as well as a question. And I'm sure that the Pharisees think, ha ha, he escaped us the first time, but now we've got him. Now we've got him. Well, in verse 8, we have uh, Jesus' response. And uh, it's not at all what the Pharisees were expecting, I'm sure. And I don't want you to miss everything that's there. And one of the things that there, that's there, class, is that Jesus' response shows that he pays attention to the details of God's word as well as the bigger message. And essentially, what Jesus says implies if not explicitly says, you guys who are supposed to be so knowledgeable in the law and the keepers of the law, you haven't even paid attention to the details of what the law says. Shame on you. How do I get that out of verse 8? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives... Because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. This is interesting. Jesus is doing several things. He's saying, yeah, I agree there are divorces that God has permitted. But he permitted them for a specific reason. What's the specific reason? Because of the hardness of your heart. Some of your translations say, because of the stubbornness of your heart. That Hebrew phrase that's translated there has the idea of someone who is dead set against doing what God wants and you can't change their mind. They're stubborn in their disobedience. Well, in what way were they stubborn in their disobedience? Well, God 
wanted marriage to be permanent. And they couldn't handle that requirement. They wanted to get out of marriage if it didn't go perfectly. And um, they thought that was okay. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Uh, God's standard was permanence in marriage. He's allowed you to divorce because you were so stubborn in your sin that you refused to live in accord with his high and holy standard which he intended from the beginning which was what? Permanence in marriage. Now should that be worn as a badge of courage or of uh, award? Uh-uh. Oh, I get to divorce and remarry. Terrific. That's proof that you and your spouse weren't able to meet the standard that God originally set forth. I don't think I would publicize that. That doesn't speak bad about God and his standards. That speaks bad about us and what we do with God's standard. Am I sure that uh, Jesus has this in mind that he, he wants to point again back to God's original. Yeah, I am because of the last part of verse 8. After Jesus explains why God permitted divorce, he again comes back to creation ordinances. But it was not this way from the beginning. Well, why wasn't it this way from the beginning? Because that's not God's holy standard. What has happened since the beginning is not something to be proud about and to have intramural debates where you make nice debaters points with one another about, oh, yeah, burning the toast would be okay, but, you know, failure to boil the egg long enough wouldn't, or it, it should be. That has nothing to do with the real issue that marriage is serious business. It's a great gift from God and he intended it to be a lifelong gift from whenever you get it through the rest of your lives. And you've lost track of that. And all you can focus on is how can I get out of this one and get on to the next wife? Not that I have any intention of that one being permanent. You know. Uh, how far the people of God had fallen from God's intention. But I'm sure you also notice uh, a further difference between what Jesus said and what the Pharisees said about what Moses said. The Pharisees ask why Moses commanded divorce. Jesus doesn't say, well, he commanded it because of this. Jesus says, he permitted it or he allowed it. And since you were here on Monday, you now know the difference between moral obligation and moral permission. Right? Moral obligation is a thou shalt, thou shalt not. And there's no debate about it. Moral permission means, well, I don't know whether there's a moral absolute there, but because I don't know that there is one that covers it, I guess I could do it without uh, gaining further moral censure and guilt. Uh, there's a world of difference between being commanded to do something and being allowed to do something, right? Uh, 
think about the instructions you give to your kids. Uh, there are certain things that you command them to do and that you command them not to do. And a lot of our kids think, well, anything where mom and dad didn't say no, I can do. I'm allowed. I'm permitted. Uh, well, that may actually what mom and dad said may only suggest that they weren't giving a totally exhaustive list of all the rules. They just were hitting the high notes, so to speak, the more important things. And you've assumed because they didn't outlaw it, that means you're allowed. Well, maybe mom and dad would allow it, but maybe not. But if it's commanded, there's no debate. So why am I saying all these things? To, to illustrate that there really is a difference between allowed and commanded, permitted and commanded. So uh, this isn't just a debate about words. It's a debate about what Moses really said, isn't it? Um, and wouldn't it make a whole lot of difference if Moses permitted as opposed to commanded, commanded as opposed to permitted? If the Pharisees are right that Moses commanded, then that means Moses commanded divorce and what Jesus says Moses taught contradicts what Moses commanded, right? And it also contradicts what Jesus says Moses taught. But if Jesus is right that Moses permitted, though he didn't command it, well, that wouldn't contradict what Moses says about marriage as he records what God says about marriage in Genesis 1 and 2, right? You could still, it could still be true that God wants marriages to be permanent, but he has allowed divorce. And we saw the reason he, allow, he allowed it is that people were too stubborn and sinful to live in accord with the high and lofty goal set for marriage in the very beginning. And we've already said, I wouldn't go around publicizing that fact uh, if I was divorced as, as though it was proof that I was a great person. Now, please don't misunderstand. I understand uh, that there are situations where the other person is far more the guilty party than you were if there was a divorce. Not insensitive to that. But what I'm saying is that what's troublesome is that a lot of people are involved in divorce and remarriage and they are very free and public about announcing that and talking about it rather matter-of-factly and not particularly embarrassed or thinking that shows any sort of defect in them. Well, it does show some kind of defect, maybe in one spouse, maybe in the other, maybe in both. What's the defect? They couldn't live in accord with God's original ten intention for marriage, that it be permanent. Do you think it is a positive recommendation for someone to find out that God has commanded something, he intends something, and we can't do, we refuse to do what he commanded because we're stubbornly holding on to our sin. We'd rather hold on to our sinful wishes than yield to what he wants us to do. 
I don't think that's an advertisement. Positive advertisement for someone as to their character, as to their walk with the Lord, etc., etc. Well, but there, let's not miss the point. The, the further point. It matters, doesn't it, as to whether Jesus is right that Moses permitted or the Pharisees are right that he commanded. And it matters not just because we'd like to know whether Jesus knows his Bible and the Pharisees know their Bible well enough and we like to know whether scripture contradicts itself and whether Moses contradicts himself. I mean, and all of those other things. But there's something, you know, uh, practical about this issue. If Moses commands divorce... Uh, then that will allow us to do certain things. And if he allows it, that doesn't mean that he says you have to do it under whatever circumstance. Well, how are we going to find out who's right and who's wrong? Well, uh, I know you and I are prejudiced in favor of Jesus. But, you know, let, let's try to give each side a fair hearing. How would we do that? Well, um, in what passage would Moses have commanded that you give a certificate of divorcement and send her away? Uh, what Old Testament passage would that have happened in? Well, the only one I can really think of that uses that kind of language is Deuteronomy 24. So, uh, I think we better go back to Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and find out who's right. How are we going to do that? Well, we know the difference between descriptive and prescriptive language, right? And for the Pharisees to be right, we need prescriptive language. We need a command. For Jesus to be right, we don't want a command. We'd better not find a command of this sort. So, what I'm going to do, class, is I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to read it basically phrase by phrase. And periodically, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, any prescription so far? And you'll tell me whether you've heard one or not. And that's the way we're going to figure out whether Jesus or the Pharisees are right, though we already know the answer. But... Uh, this gives the Pharisees a fair hearing. Okay, so here goes. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. Any prescription so far? No, this is just describing a situation. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. Any prescription so far? Well, not explicitly, um, but basically the language is descriptive. He does this, and then he does that, and then he does the other. Does that say, um, oh, and by the way, everyone who reads this, you're supposed to do the same? No. So no command yet. Uh, next phrase. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, any prescription yet? Nope. And her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her away from his house. Any prescription yet? Still describing a situation. A pretty messy one. But not unusual in that day. Uh, or if he dies, any prescription yet? 
Nope, still describing a situation. Verse 4, Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. Any prescription yet? Yes. Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again. That's the prescription. Is it a prescription that says you have to divorce your wife? No. Is it a prescription that says you have to give her a bill of divorcement? No. So there is a prescription in this passage, but it's not the one that the Pharisees said was there. Uh, the next part of verse 4, that would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Is that prescription or description? description? Well, it's description, but really most of all, it's a moral evaluation of what's just been described. And as such, it's not a prescription. It sort of reinforces the idea that you had better not violate the rule that we just laid down. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Description or prescription? Prescription. prescription. But is the prescription saying you have to divorce anybody? No. Nope. Is it saying you have to give anyone a bill of divorcement? Nope. So guess who's right? Not the Pharisees. There's nothing in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 that explicitly says you have to divorce your wife and send her away. There is something implicit in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 about a certificate of divorcement. What is it? Well, um, in the description of the woman and the husband in question, what is described is that the husband gives her a certificate of divorcement and sends her away. Now, why would he do that? What was the purpose of that? Well, um, the answer is rather startling, but also rather important. Even in Moses' day, let alone after that, divorce was so very common and was being done on such flimsy things, flimsy reasons, that it seemed like quite frequently a husband would get unhappy with his wife and he'd kick her out of the house. And uh, people who would see that wouldn't know whether her being kicked out of the house now means she's divorced and so we can strike up a relationship with her and we can marry her or is it just that the husband is angry with her and he's not divorcing her and you know she can come back in the house a little bit later and everything will be okay. Uh, how would you as a neighbor, as a passerby, know whether her being on the street means that she is divorced or that her hung husband is just angry with her and they're taking some downtime from one another? You wouldn't. Well, you might say, well, what difference does it make? If she's there, strike up the relationship and, uh, you know, if you want to get married to her and she wants to, terrific. Uh, 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 wait a minute. What did the Mosaic Law say about uh, what you should do to people who were adulterers and adulteresses? Stone them to death. So, uh, now, what is adultery? What's the definition of adultery? Having 
sexual relations with someone that you're not married to, but someone else is married to, right? That's what adultery is. Well, then if this woman who's been kicked out of the house and is on the street is not divorced and I take up a relationship with her and I even marry her, I'm marrying someone and having sex relations with someone who's another man's wife. I'm guilty of adultery, which under the Mosaic law means that my new wife and me are supposed to be executed. And so now if he had divorced her, then of course taking up a relationship with her and marrying her is not going to, and having sex relations with her is not going to make you guilty of committing adultery. Well, okay, I see that, you say, I see that that's a serious kind of issue. I, uh, maybe I hadn't realized that before. But e even so, suppose the woman says, uh, you know, don't touch me, I'm, I'm still married. Or, you know, don't. Yeah, we can start going, uh, going out together. Uh, wouldn't you want to know given the seriousness of the punishment for adultery, wouldn't you really want to know whether she was still married or not? Sure. I mean, common sense would say you better know. Uh, but not just you as another man. Um, this has implications for her because what's the situation, the status of women in society at that time, even up to and including Jesus' day, um, how were the needs of women and their children to be cared for in those societies? Could a woman be kicked out of the house and, you know, divorced and say, well, you know, I, I don't need a man. I'll go off and I'll get a job and I'll become head of a corporation. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Women in Jewish culture had no rights. The way that a woman's needs and her children's needs were satisfied, well, she had basically three options. Either you're married and your husband takes care of everything, or... You're not married and you go out and you make money to support yourself by prostitution or, and we know what the Mosaic Law says is supposed to be done to people who are prostitutes and those who frequent her. So that's not a good option either. Uh, or your other option is you meet your needs by begging on the street and hope that people will take pity on you and you know, give you some financial sustenance. So that's not a good option. Uh, so of the, op of the alternatives of how a woman could get her and her children's needs taken care of, of those three, what, what's the best option? Well, obviously, that she be married. So if she gets divorced or gets thrown out of the house and it's because she's divorced, she would naturally want to hook up with another husband as soon as possible. Otherwise, what are my other options? I can't get, you know, uh, a government loan and get my BA and get a job. Not in that society. Well, wasn't it better in Jesus' time not necessarily for Jewish women in Greco-Roman culture, which is what was there during the Roman Empire. The status of women was better than it had been in Judaism, but it still wasn't anything like today. Uh, women still were pretty much dependent upon their husband to support them and their kids. So... It's clear that if a woman doesn't have a husband to take care of her, she needs a new husband. But if 
it's not clear that she has been duly and fully divorced from the first husband. No other man would be of sane, uh, sane mind, of right mind, to take up a relationship with her because if she's not divorced from her first husband and I take up a relationship with her and I marry her, I'm going to be and she's going to be guilty of adultery and we both should be executed. So God knows that that's what's going on and Moses knows that women are getting thrown out of the house willy-nilly and they're put in this vulnerable position and their kids are as well. And God doesn't say, well, you know, if you guys would have just lived holier lives and obeyed my commands about marriage and everything else, everything would be okay. You know, work out the problems yourself. I'll pray for you. No, that's not God's answer. Even when we fail miserably in obeying God's law, a gracious God says, I know you blew it, but I can help and I will. So what does God do? Through Moses, it became the custom and the understanding that if you throw your wife out of the house and you intend to really divorce her, make that clear. How do you make that clear? Give her a bill of divorcement so that any other man who becomes interested in her, it's not just going to be her say-so. There's a document he can look at and say, okay, she's free. I can marry her. I'm, if I do that, I'm not going to be guilty. The point of that legislation was to protect the rights and the well-being of helpless women and their children in that society. So the fact that Moses describes this bill of divorcement as something that is given, it's still a description, but it suggests that, well, you should ask the question, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that because of the reasons that I've suggested, and that must mean that God and Moses understanding the plight of women in such a society makes a point to make it a rule that if you're going to divorce someone and you really mean it, give her a bill of a divorcement so that she's not left for supporting herself to either prostitution or begging as her only options. Or to marry someone else when you're still married to your first husband, which then means your other alternative is to become an adulterer and you and your new husband get executed. So that's why I say there's, there's not an explicit command in Deuteronomy 24, but what's described there suggests that there's been some rule that Moses implemented But what the Pharisees are doing with this is something that Moses is not doing. We, we saw that with what Moses describes, divorce was happening and, and remarriage was happening and the people who were divorcing and remarrying were not being executed, so God graciously was allowing them to do this without punishing them beyond the fact that their marriage was broken. So Jesus is right. God allowed it. Moses permitted it. Uh, but don't have that smirk of satisfaction on your face thinking, see, um, I can quote the Bible too, to support my view. Uh, 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 uh. The Bible doesn't support the Pharisees view. In the first place. Because Moses didn't command it. He permitted it. And he permitted it for a reason. That all of you should be embarrassed about. 
you couldn't live up to God's standard and instead of executing you for the sins that you are committing by divorcing and remarrying, God graciously allows the people who are the most victimized, the wives and their children, a way to not become totally victimized by maybe marrying someone thinking they were free and they weren't and then they marry someone and now they're guilty of adultery and now she's supposed to be executed and those kids won't have a mother. God says, Moses says, we're not going to do that to the women in our community. So, um, well, you might be saying, well, if, all right, if there is implicit in Deuteronomy 24 a command to give a bill of divorce, somewhere it must be explicit. I don't know of a passage in the Old Testament where there is that, that kind of command. It is described as being done in Deuteronomy 24. Do we know that that must have meant that Moses set forth a rule? Well, maybe he just said it would be a good, here's, here's a good suggestion. You know, if you're going to do this, it would be good if you'd give a certificate of divorcement. You don't have to, but, you know, it, don't have the marriage end on such a nasty note that, that you don't take some foresight to protect your former wife. I mean, he could have said something like that. He, he probably, knowing the way Moses writes and all the other laws, he, he probably made a command to the people. For some reason, he didn't write it down as a command. He just described it. Uh, I'm sure figuring that those who would read this book would all know what the rules were. But the implicit command that's there is not at all what the Pharisees are doing. But look also, class, as you come back then and as you think about all of this, look at how perverse the Pharisees are. And not just the Pharisees, but probably other people in Jesus' day, and how perverse the human heart is. What are they doing? They're taking the teaching of Moses, which intends to protect the rights and the well-being of the most vulnerable people in society, women and their children. And rather than focusing on that, the Pharisees are making an allusion to that and using it in their argument to justify divorce and remarriage and to trip Jesus up and show that he's not as great as a lot of you folk think he is. That's perverse. Using God's word against God's word. The Pharisees are appealing to Moses to contradict Moses, which means they're using Moses to contradict God. And in the process of it, to justify their godless, sinful misunderstanding of the main point of the Pentateuch on marriage, that God wanted it to be permanent, that God in, it was God's idea in the first place because God knew it wasn't good for man to be alone. And God knew that the only suitable mate would not be a really loving dog or cat. It would have to be a human being, a female. And then God did what needed to be done to create one. And then told not only Adam and Eve, but all of us that, you know, when you find that one that I have for you, live the rest of your lives together 
what are the Pharisees doing? Do you think they even got that message from reading Genesis 1 through 2? I don't know that they ever got that message. But whether they ever did or didn't, the only thing they wanted to focus on was Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, a, a two-word phrase, ervat devar, and you know better than to do exegesis like that, and you're not a Pharisee. You don't determine the meaning of a sentence by isolating two words, ripping them out of the sentence, and then doing anything you want with them. Um, you know that if you isolate them so you can do a word study on all the possible things it can mean, that's not the end of the study. You still have to put the words back into the sentence and see how it's being used there. You were not taught to do exegesis that way and you don't read text that way, which means you're smarter than the Pharisees and you probably haven't had as much training as they did. Why can't they get it? You do. I'm sure you do. Some of you may be first-year students and you already get it. Well, it's not just an intellectual issue, is it, class? It's a matter of the heart. Some people don't get spiritual truth because they don't study it. They're ignorant of it. Some people don't get it because they know it and they refuse to accept it, they'd rather focus on the stuff that supports what they'd like to do. Yep. Yep, we're all inclined in that direction on some issue or issues. You're absolutely right. But we're not talking about your common, everyday garden variety Jew. We're talking about the Pharisees. These are the people who God entrusted with the spiritual oversight of the Jewish people. Uh, there are parallel, uh, parables that Jesus spoke about that. You remember the one about the owner of the vineyard and the caregivers or the caretakers of the vineyard and they weren't concerned at all for the owner's interests? And so the owner sent various emissaries to tell them to get their act together and they killed every one of them. And Jesus said, the owner then says, well, I'll send them my son and surely they'll respect him. And when they saw him, they said, oh, let's get him. He's the heir. If we kill him, the old man will eventually be dead and then we'll have it all. And what does Jesus say the point of the parable is? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And, oh, by the way, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, you spiritual leaders. It's going to be taken from you and given to a people displaying the fruits thereof. That does not mean Israel is losing the kingdom. I'll throw that in for free. <laughs> uh, that means that the kingdom leadership, the spiritual leadership is being taken away from the Pharisees and given to other people who will tend the master's vineyard for him, not for them. Uh, and if you're, if you're not quite sure that that's what Jesus meant, you, you think maybe he was removing the kingdom from Israel altogether, please be sure to read to the end of the chapter. Matthew 21, this is where this is, the parable of the tenants. When the chief priests, verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, parable, they knew he was talking about them. Now, it's also true that any ordinary Jew who doesn't display the fruits of the kingdom, they're, they're not going to get in on kingdom blessings either, but that's a very different thing than saying, that the whole nation has been disinherited. Um, now, when the Pharisees hear the, hear the parable, they're at least intelligent enough to get the message. But it's good that Matthew confirms that. 
to help us be sure to get the message, the whole story correctly. And then Matthew says they looked for, that is the Pharisees, they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. What a pathetic handling of spiritual duties and spiritual office. Don't be a Pharisee in any thing that comes up in your ministry in the local church or wherever it is. Don't learn God's word so you can use it against God's word and against God's people and against God to further your own agenda, perverse agenda. I mean, this is really perverse. Taking a passage of scripture and perhaps even, if you want to call it, a legislation intended to protect poor, vulnerable people and ignoring their interests and using it to prove that the Son of God is a phony and thereby showing that you are a fraud as a spiritual leader. Now that's perverse. That's perversity 101. Give it an A++. Pretty hard to be much more perverse than that. 